also uh, talking about the UK, we want to bring in a very special guest who we have for with us, uh, Lord Rigsby. It's so a pleasure to have you here with us, a member of the House of Lords, a conservative member of the U uh, UK Parliament. We want to talk about the situation in the Ukraine, which you have a lot of knowledge about, something you looked at closely here. Kind of break it down for us, for our mostly American audience, on what this all means in terms of the relationship between the UK and the EU and the, U I'm sorry, uh, the UK as well, but the EU and the Ukraine as well as the Ukraine and Russia. Ukraine has had a very tragic history and has always been dominated by Russia. It was part of the old Soviet bloc. There was a famine there. There has always been a very difficult relationship. But what has happened is that there's been a breakdown in the relationship between Ukraine and the European Union. They were offered an association agreement and a free trade arrangement with the European Union, which was popular. Unfortunately, no money was involved. And the difficulty is that they are essentially bankrupt as a country. And so Mr. Putin has come along and said, OK, we'll give you the money on certain conditions. And this is why you're getting this terrible problem now in the country of division over this argument. And it would seem that Mr. Putin is putting influence on President Yanukovych in a way which people certainly do not like. They feel that their democratic underpinnings are being threatened at the moment. When you look at the financial side of this, it would look like almost as if uh, Putin's trying to buy allegiance from Yanukovych here. I think uh, the thing about Yanukovych, and all politicians certainly in most countries, it's regime survival. He cannot get through to the next presidential election without money. That's a simple truth. And the Europeans have not offered that money. And the reason why, in part, they have not offered that money is they take the view that the regime is too corrupt. What would happen to the money? So this is a terrible uh, standoff. It's causing mayhem to the economy. The uh, pressures on people are now enormous. And we're seeing this tragic situation where people are being killed. Now, earlier in this program, we were a little uh, harsh, I guess you could say, on the, the United States, President Obama and the White House for their a lack of leadership on this. But you don't think it's really the United States' place to get involved actively in this situation? Well, of course, the United States, being the mother nation of democracy in the world, is always interested in other countries pursuing democratic ideals. But this is really up to the Europeans to try to resolve this because the difficulties arose because this association agreement was not signed. And that was after two years of negotiation. And at the last minute, President Yanukovych didn't sign because he wanted the money from Mr. Putin. And, and you say there's a need to triangulate here. There's going to have to be an effort made to work with Vladimir Putin on this, no matter how aggressive he is in all of this. I think inevitably. The thing about countries, you can't escape your geography. And Mother Russia is a very important, takes half of their exports and their trade. It is essential that he's brought into the loop. How that is possible when he's being so assertive and given that he doesn't want them to go down the European track is a matter for real diplomatic skill. But I'm afraid until the Europeans find a way through financially, I think President Yanukovych is going to resist. But of course, we don't know what will happen. We've had an orange revolution in the past, which uh, got rid of a previous president. So it's a very unknown and tragic situation that they're dealing with. And if we take a step back and look at this uh, in more broader terms and for what it means for the European Union, tell us, what does it mean if, if the Ukraine continues and Yanukovych continues to move uh, towards a closer allegiance with Putin? Well, I think it would be very unfortunate because the whole point about the European Union is it has wanted to embrace the former Soviet countries and bring them into the democratic ideals which underpin the European Union. And of course, through that relationship, the association agreement, we would have seen reforms in the economy beginning as mm -hmm. part of the deal. That is unlikely to happen if he goes down the Putin route. Okay, of course, the EU dealing with continued problems with, fi uh, with debt in Greece and Spain and Portugal as well. We talked briefly a second ago about the referendum in the UK about the EU. Talk to us about that relationship. It seems that there could be a little tension growing there as well. You know, one of the problems of the European Union is the so-called democratic deficit. And more and more power has gone to the center. And people feel alienated from this. They feel that once the power goes to the center, they can't change it. Now, in normal parliamentary democracies, laws can be changed. It's very difficult to do it in the European Union. And the extent of influence on national member states is growing and growing and causing difficulties to us. We are, after all, a long-standing parliamentary democracy. We're very proud of our judicial system. We feel that the interference has grown too much. But, you know, also, there's another factor. The European Union economy is sclerotic. We have made all sorts of difficult economic reforms, many are reluctant to do so, and we feel that the role of the European Union in the world economy needs to modernize and update. We're in a global race, 
and they stuck many of them in a mindset which is now completely out of date. And what you're talking about are some of the austerity measures that Cameron and, and the UK have put into place as a result of this uh, tough economic time that we're seeing across the globe. Tell us about why those austerity measures have worked, much to the chagrin of a lot of uh, liberal economists who say you need more money, not less in exactly. the economy. We inherited the deficit from the, the Blair Brown government at 11 percent. Our currency went down 25 percent. We had no alternative but to be very tough and cut back on government spending. We've reduced the deficit. We were told under huge pressure from people on the left this was going to cause huge unemployment, social problems. It's entirely the reverse. Our economy is now growing the fastest in Europe. We've created a huge number of new jobs. The public sector has shrunk. It's a great success story, and it's the exact opposite of what we were told would be happen by the so-called left economists. And it's exactly what uh, countries like Greece have, have tried to avoid. Why aren't we seeing the European Union then emulate those austerity measures in these other countries? I think it's difficult because the one advantage we have, we're not part of the Eurozone. Now the Eurozone means that you have a single currency, you have the same rate of interest which applies in Athens or Dublin or Helsinki. Right. We have the flexibility of being able to control our own interest rates. They don't. That is part of their problem very little flexibility. All right, while we have you here, Lord Rigsby, I wanted to also talk about your role as a special envoy to the nation of Algeria. There's uh, been a lot of talk recently. Prime Minister David Cameron recently visited Algeria. Algeria has been an exception uh, after the Arab Spring here. He talked with his counterpart, Abdel Malik Salah, on the security cooperation between uh, Algeria, trying to fight off jihadi groups in the wake of the Al-Qaeda attack on that BP gas plant in Algeria uh, uh, not long ago. Uh, Cameron is the first prime minister, British prime minister, to visit Algeria since it won its independence from France all the way back in 1962. Talk about, with us, Lord Risby, about the important relationship between the UK and Algeria right now. It's a fantastic relationship, and we call it a partnership. Let me explain something. That they had an Islamist takeover, and they were so horrified by this over 20 years ago. People were being decapitated in the streets. Something like 150,000 people got killed. They absolutely detest the forms of extreme Islamism you're seeing in some other, other Arab countries. We are helping them on security and defense matters. They have a huge border to patrol. Some of the discordant elements from Libya have been crossing the border. It's a remarkably stable country, and they have the wealth, happily, through oil and gas to be able to improve their health services, their education, etc. So we have a really good relationship with and them. It, and it's an important one to highlight and, and to use as an example for these other countries because uh, it could really make a difference to try and stabilize the region as a, as a whole. We have to run. Lord Risby, it's been a pleasure having you here. Unfortunately, I've got to go to a commercial break, and it's been an honor talking with you, and hopefully we can get you back sometime to discuss these Thank issues. Thank you so more. much. All right, we have much more to come here on America's Forum. We'll be right back with more. Of course, we want to hear from you on any of these topics that we've been able uh, had on the show here to discuss. You can find me on Twitter, John B underscore Newsmax, or tweet any of us here on the program at Newsmax TV. We'll be right back with more right after this.